So at greetings, everyone. Um, today we have Dr. Terry Carr, who is the current Director of Career Education and Development here at Stockton University. Today we are focusing on access and building networks for Black and Latinx students. So at this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Carr to begin her conversation for today. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm really excited about this presentation. It should spark some insightful and valuable conversations on a topic that's very important and timely. Um, the presentation will cover some research I conducted for my dissertation at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, as Jana said, focused on the college to career transition of racially minoritized students. I'd like to thank Dr. Ketching for organizing this fantastic forum and around, around the work that is needed um, to support Black and Latinx students. Before we, get, before we get moving, the term racially minoritized students includes Black and Latinx students, and I will use them interchangeably, but I'm gonna read this passage because I don't wanna get it wrong about the definition and where the idea of minoritized comes from. So Black and Latinx groups have been historically racially minoritized in the US. The term racially minoritized students is, op is opposed to students of so excuse me, students of color and minority students is informed by Benitez 2010, who used the word mi minoritized. This simply is used to intend to infer the process of minoritizing a person, an action versus being a, a um, noun, uh, the noun of a student being uh, minoritized that reflects the understanding of a minority status, which is a total social construct in specific societal context. So let me formally introduce myself. My name is Terry Carr. I have the honor and privilege of leading career education and development here at Stockton. The title of my presentation and dissertation, if you have nothing to do and like to look it up, <laughs> and you just like reading dissertations, is called um, career uh, Collaborative Project, Career Services, racial, excuse me, Supporting Racially Minoritized Students, College to Career Transition. It's a lot, and it was a lot to write, too. Um, today's conversation will be offered through the lens of inclusive student success. More specifically, career services role in fostering post-graduation success. What we'll go over today, since I would like to be mindful and uh, respectful of time, I would like to quickly go over what you will hear today. First, I will share with you the overview of the research, its problem, its purpose, and its inquiry questions. Then I will offer you highlights of the literature, and then moving ahead towards a brief description of the, the guiding framework on into the findings. And afterwards, I will open the floor for questions and comments, where I think we've decided that we will have you raise your hand and then unmute yourself, or we'll have you unmute um, so that you can ask your questions. At the time of this, at the time of this research, the nation's unemployment rate was at the lowest that had been in six years prior. While the news touted very good news about unemployment, it failed to tell the real full story and paint the full picture of the experiences of Black and Latinx graduates who were twice as likely to be unemployed over their white peers. If you look here in this slide, it is a general report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2008. The national unemployment rate for those with a bachelor's degree averaged 2.7%, the lowest it had been in six years. However, the unemployment rate for blacks holding a bachelor's degree almost doubled the average at 4.1%, and Latinx graduates averaged 3.7. Comparatively, the average for whites was lower um, lower than the overall average. They came in at 2.4. As you can see, comparatively, the, num the numbers were slightly higher, I mean, excuse me, slightly lower in 2019. Yet nothing, uh, nothing significant that still, we still warrant, uh, we have to pay attention to this uh, discrepancy. 
to this um, to this gap. So, um, with that said, <clears throat> excuse me. Contextually, our current COVID economic environment, the numbers are appearing to be a little daunting um, for Black and and Latinx graduates. Although considerable research has had has paid attention to the unemployment discrepancies plaguing Black and and Latinx people. The unsettling result is that there has been no clear explanation as to why the disparities exist. The only other option here is that it involves race, racism, or structural racism, institutionalized and systemic racism. Depicted here on this chart generated by the economic policy um, in 2019, black workers <clears throat> excuse me, on the, it should be on your left. Black workers were twice as likely to be unemployed. This was 2019. For blacks with a four-year degree, the rate was 3.5. Granted, it went down from 4.1 in 2018. The rate for whites dropped as well from 2.2, from, excuse me, from 2.2, down to 2.2, from 2.7. Um, the anticipated uh, fallout facing Black and Latinx will be considerate with the point with with the current reports coming in for COVID. So if you take a look over to your right at this um, this chart that depicts the unemployment rate just from February and May, Black Black and Latinx people have the highest rate of unemployment, particularly that of Latinx women. This is a harsh reality, a reality for our country, our cultures, and our students of color, specifically Black and Latinx. Today we are here to explore what I did to approach the issue um, to help create equitable opportunities for racially minoritized students. Oh, okay. Sorry, I forgot about that part. So here you go. So with this, this points out the college, those with the college and the unemployment rate here between whites and blacks, 3.5% for whites, um, for blacks, and then 2.2% for uh, whites in uh, 2009. And then over here is um, the Hispanic women chart that it's up there at 19% right now between the May chart and the um, excuse me, the February chart and the May chart, um, the data that came in from uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics that were reported by Economic Policy, the Economic Policy Institute. So um, this is, this data is as of uh, May to 2020. As a student affairs professional, a career services practitioner and a woman of color, I was both dismayed by and drawn to this phenomenon. I wanted to know how I could disrupt the system, inject critical consciousness through equitable practices and create opportunities for racially minoritized students within the sphere of my influence. Day and Cruz Vigera, 2014, reminds us that the purpose of career centers in the 21st century is to help students build relationships and create connections and pool capital that provide valuable resources. The purpose of this inquiry was to examine how a student career intervention, a coaching project called the Career Collaborative Project, conducted with, within the Career Education Office at a small private institution, helped Black and Latinx students access, build, and expand their capital, the tools and relationships needed for a successful post-graduation transition. The career intervention created for this inquiry aimed to improve racially minoritized students' college to career transition by connecting them to alumni of color to help them clarify goals and the approaches to those goals. To do this, the following inquiry questions guided my work. How does the career program aimed at 
excuse me, aim to racially, to help racially minoritized students access and build social networks to support their post transition, post graduation transition. And I tell you, it was hard for me to say right now, and it's been hard for me to say since, but the, the bulk and the heart of this is, is how do, how do career services make this intentional thing, this, this, this focus? How do we inject intentionality in connecting black and brown students to alumni as um, tools to help with the transition from college to career? The second question I had is actually, how do we do that? Using alumni as what they call institutional agents, right? How do institutional agents help racially minoritized students build social networks? Is it possible for us to do this? Those are the questions that I wanted to know. For this in inquiry, I wanted to see if career services could support the transition for Black and Latinx students by utilizing in institutional agents. Career services has the ability to organize resources and enact institutional agents. We should do more to shepherd black and brown graduates into the workforce. My hypothesis stood that intentionality designed, intentionally designed interventions would help racialized minoritized students identify realistic post-graduation goals, access and build their social networks, and identify resources to help achieve their post-graduation goals. With that, help identify resources to help overcome specific barriers and challenges as it relates, relate to, relates to race. That's a lot to say. This work was grounded in empirical data, theoretical and, con and a conceptual framework, my professional observations and experience, as well as these inquiry questions. Y'all hanging in there? Okay. So to quickly highlight some of the literature, I offer a few sec sections of my literature review. So not the full review, of course, we're limited on time and there was a lot. The first I want you to know about um, the histor historical and evolution of career services. In what ways were Blacks and Latinx people considered? As you can see here, in the beginning, in the 19, as early as the 1900s, vocational guidance was offered to Slavic races migrating to the U.S. Voc vocational guidance, training, or services did not include persons of color. Even at the end of World War II, when service personnel returned from war and began to emerge into college campuses, Black veterans were denied the use of their benefits countrywide. As we move into the structure and the purpose, scholars vocalized various shortcomings related to career staff and programs and services. Overall, the literature exposed a, a need for social justice, equitable practice in career services, there was a call for, diff for diverse staff, a call for professionals who are culturally competent and recognize that students come from different backgrounds and, and, and that those backgrounds are complex. The most, important, um, the most important issue to arise in the literature, most of the literature was race neutral and entered on a sameness to provide student support. So everything was layered um, in terms of service and helping students succeed or student successes based on sameness, which essentially is grounded in whiteness. Unfortunately, acknowledged by Layer 2003, career services still continues to offer universal service and Williams 2007 encouraged career services to maintain a perspective that the student body is not homogeneous.
to give you some background regarding where the research took place, I would try to paint a picture of an environment that inherently contained, constrained the success of Black and Latinx students. The research took place at a small private liberal arts institution located in rural Northwest Pennsylvania with a population of 2,100 students. In 2008, Black and Latinx students only made up 308, collectively and evenly split. Just in 2012, the institution had a total of 50 minoritized students. As indicated here in the institution, the institution had a turbulent history and culture regarding race and religion, founded in 1815 for white Protestant males of the Methodist faith. Quote, the college reflected a Anglo-Saxon and Protestant citizenry that had founded and sustained the college and still held established power in both na nation and in town. That's by Helmrich, um, who wrote the institution's history book. The college's his history showed that it had failed to integrate Latinx students. The Latinx presence was glaringly missing from Helmrich's book. There's a section in the book um, titled Population, uh, Diverse Population and Discrimination. In it, it talks about religion and doesn't speak of any persons of Hispanic or Latin descent. Much like the Career Services Office across, across the country, there at that institution, uh, services were offered with a color neutral lens. And it was assumed that services were beneficial of all students regardless of cultural backgrounds. And looking at how we could, eat, how we could or even if we could, uh, if career services somehow could expedite the process um, through which minoritized students could access networks that were inherently um, available to them when they got to campus, I looked at two theories. One was Bordeaux's uh, 1986 social capital expanded by Coleman in 1988. That better, that better identify the successful transference of capital resources. And then to add to that, Stanton Salazar's um, institutional agents. Coleman in 19, uh, excuse me, Coleman 1988, reasoned that all social relations and social structures facilitate some form of social capital, actors, people, um, establish relationships purposefully and continue time, continue in time when they, sorry, hold up, when they, there you go, continue to provide benefits, sorry about that, when they continue to provide benefits. Um, he continued to say certain kinds of social structure are especially important in facilitating some forms of social capital. In an institutional agent, agents are individuals who occupy one or more hierarchical positions of relatively high status and authority. Such individuals situated in a student's social network manifest their potential role as an institutional agent. When on behalf of the student, they act to directly transmit or negotiate on behalf of the student. Salazar also acknowledged that while um, most characteristics of the concept of social capital are in elusive quality, he put forth that the framework that def defines social capital as consisting of resources and key forms of social support embedded in one's network or association and, accept and accessible through direct or indirect ties with institutional agents. So essentially, however we're able to get students connected to these folks that have the agency to help students, whether that be with a strong or weak tie, those are the responsibility for an institution, a campus, to be able to connect those conduits, right? 
in my work, I decided to utilize action research. Action, re action research is a methodology of, that offers flexibility for a practitioner to pinpoint and address inequities um, and to observe practice and help to provide solutions to those problems. Action researchers seek immediate action to solve problems as quickly as possible and to create change. Typically, action research seeks to improve a localized issue within the de a department, organization, community, um, or and is typically this type of research is done in K through 12, but I found the, the tool valuable and wanted to utilize it so that I can get the most, um, the quickest feedback for this type of uh, program, this type of project. Oh, so you can see here. So when you look at the action research, it just goes in a cycle. So once you get to the end of the cycle, you evaluate what went well and what didn't go well. You make those corrections and you put it back into play. As a result of the examination, the student alumni career coaching circles were, um, was the intervention that was created. It was a 10 week intervention um, that was implemented to measure outcomes. A post focus group was conducted with the student participants. Focus, sorry, excuse me. Group reflections were done after each coaching sessions and then interviews were done with each coach. The data was then organized and analyzed to look for themes and patterns to look for more improvement for the next iteration of the project. And what you see here is actually the career collaborative project in itself, what the model looks like. So the participants, small group participants are um, our best, um, I can't think of what I'm looking for. Small, if you, small groups between five and seven is where you're going to get the most rich learning, right? And so the coach is the center of, of this learning. And so the students actually learn from each other and they learn from the coach. And so that's why it's called a collaborative. You're learning both directly and indirectly. You want that intrinsic learning and you also want the direct learning. So they did have a... Um, a curriculum to learn from, that learn from. They also had those intimate conversations with coaches regarding um, what to look for and how to navigate um, certain challenges and barriers that they were looking at. And as you see on the right there, that's essentially what the, um, what the timeline for the project looked like um, in 2019. Right, we're almost home, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and so finally, we're gonna talk about the findings. Here are my inquiry findings um, to each question. To understand the participating students, uh, how they were engaged in thinking about um, graduation how, uh, or post-graduation. I wanted to uncover their feelings and thoughts regarding post-graduation plans. Um, if it was also, and it was also an effort to get clar clarification and identification of particular barriers or challenges that they were considering. The collaborative was designed to help Black and Latinx students access and build their social networks. During the interviews, I sought to understand how students demonstrated, described, and conceptualized their access to, to social networks using institutional agents, such as alumni of color as their career coaches. In doing so, in an effort to address my first question, four themes emerged. Sharing attitudes towards post-graduation transition. Students expressed some form of apprehension about the post-graduation transition uh, process. Whether the student was trepidatious or somewhat self-assured, Across the board, the senior, junior, seniors, and sophomores that participated um, showed some level of apprehension about the uh, about the transitioning process. Second was self-reflecting and thinking critically. Students expressed the that the collaborative created and 
and required a great deal of internal work, meaning a, a lot of self-reflection, which was important. Uh, Schlossberg um, and Chickering in the transition theory define that as the process in which this starts the process um, that the process that starts to assess um, the, uh, the transition, a person should always start to gather their resources and pay attention to what they have so that they can make the, the transition successfully. The third one is recognizing support systems. During our focus group, the students were asked to to describe how they connected to their family, friends, and campus mentors to share their post-graduation plans. Initially, they had different thoughts and ideas about the people that they shared their, um, their goals with. Um, I wanted to probe a little further so that I can understand. Uh, after some discussion, the consensus was that they understood that they all, they all knew someone who knew someone. Um, and that was an aha moment for them. But sharing their actual goals was still somewhat challenging for some of them. And then lastly, uh, discovering the significance of the Career Collaborative Project itself. Although this project created opportunities for them to do critical thinking, self-reflection, and room to be vulnerable, and a bit uncomfortable. Ultimately, it provided students with the practical methods and steps to take away, to take action steps towards their post-graduation plans. Throughout this process, the student's state of mind for the career, college to career transition um, and their post-graduation plans developed within this process. Whether it manifested through thoughts of trepidation, uncertainty, or self-assuredness, it was clear that the idea of transition from college to something uh, beyond college needed to be addressed. Sophomores, juniors, and seniors alike in this query expressed some form of apprehension, basically. Here are some of the um, quotes that I pulled. Sean, a senior black female shared, I am general, general, <laughs> gen, it's not working, generally uh, pretty confident. Coming into this program, I'm typically the type, not the type of person to ask for help, but just because I don't ask for help doesn't mean I don't need it or do, that I don't want it, which I found interesting. While Sean acknowledged a self-assurance in her response, she also revealed an unwillingness to ask for help which could be um, interpreted as a form of reservation or unease. She revealed that although she did not ask for help, it didn't mean that she didn't want it. And that hesitancy is a space that I think is responsible for us to step into. Another quote from another participant, I feel like being here in this program is kind of that process of getting out of your comfort zone. It's, about, it's almost like shaking up things, but shaking them up in, in a way that's going to enlighten you and kind of open another pathway instead of closing them. This is Angie, senior Latina. And last one. And one more, and one more extended thought on this. I had goals already, but the program gave me more confidence to know the exact plan I wanted. This program taught me to use your resources that are here for you and to, and to better prepare you. That was D, a junior black male. And that was the answer to my first question, question my inquiry question. The second inquiry question. The second inquiry question, a key aspect of this project was to use alumni of color as institutional agents, they were the key, the linchpin to making this happen. Institutional agents in this inquiry defined um, as people who possess some authority um, who could advocate on behalf of minoritized students. These were the conduits that transmitted high value resources to the students. To understand which, to which degree alumni of color helped black and Latinx students identify, access, and build social networks. I recognize two main themes when addressing my second question. 
One was uh, connecting alumni of color to um, elect, uh, <laughs> connecting alumni of color as, social, as institutional agents, and then educating students on basic communication skills. For the sake of time, I will quickly summarize their significance. First, when uh, asking students to describe the importance of connecting to alumni of color, they overwhelmingly said that it was vital collectively for all of them said it was vital for them to connect to other alumni of color. The students felt that the alumni evoked a sense of familiarity, comfort, and kinship. And while each alumni coach approached their ideas of helping students build networks very differently, they all strive to create knowledge, support, and create channels for the students to access resources um, they were not exposed to previously. A common thread between the students and the alumni emerged when I asked the overall takeaway from the collaborative. What was the overall takeaway? The responses summed up to learning and providing basic communication skills. They gained the know, the know how to reach out to people, the importance of relationship building, and the method and example of how to do that. In an effort to answer my inquiry questions, I learned that before any concrete technique or strategy could be taught, it was important to know the student states of mind regarding the actual post-graduation transition. I listened and I assessed their attitudes towards their process, their willingness to do self-reflection and to think critically. Through it all, students wanted and needed methods steps, strategies, and techniques to do and help to connect with others. They needed to know how and which of the coach and all of the coach and all of the coaches provided that for them. Here's one quote from one of the alumni coaches. Alumni coach D, a black male, offered, I tried to bring confidence Hopefully they can go out and proactively activate a network for themselves and speak with them, speak meaning with others, knowing that they will be fine and that they can do it. Another quote from one of our student participants, Kanye, senior, black female, shared here, this is her aha moment. One of the things that stood out for me is help me help you. So when you're reaching out to people, you need to tell them how they can help you because otherwise they don't know what to do. The heart of this inquiry, I investigated whether or not if institutional agents could be black Latinx students. <laughs> That's not what I meant to say at all. Um, uh, agents could help black and Latinx students build social networks um, to support their post-graduation transition. The findings show that they, were, that they could help build social networks for students and by helping them conceptualize and articulate their goals um, to empower them to build relationships and the methods to activate their own networks. The power to articulate their goals created sense, a sense of co confidence in the students because it offered them tools and techniques needed to go forward and develop their own relationships using the methods taught by the alumni coaches. From the findings, three key findings emerged. The first, career planning requires a self-examination. Students of color need help developing social networks. institutional agents at, um, and students of color um, need to develop together. Implications for practice oper and operation operationalized recommendations for Stockton. Okay. 
think I got lost. That's okay. Um, so Dr. Sujay, uh, Michael Sujay in 2006 said that students of color on predominantly white campuses need to see role models that reflect their culture group. This third finding pinpointed that alumni of color were, okay, good, essential to um, institutional agents um, as students, for students of color along their career journey. The practical implications for campus career services as they seek to design programs and services that intentionally support racially min minoritized students post-graduation transition is to better understand the backgrounds and family histories of students of color in order to fully recognize their needs. Pret in 2018 recommended that practitioners consider how to integrate culturally and social economical practice, programs, policies, performance met metrics, and communication to, uh, as an integral part of career services to ensure racially minoritized um, students feel welcomed and engaged. To that, practitioners must consider alumni as leverage, um, leveraging resources to the, to the career development process for Black and Latinx students. I found this to be prudent to activate and motivate alumni of color to support the st these students. It is not to say that students cannot receive the same support from non-Black and Latinx alumni or other professionals because there were undoubtedly demonstrated instances where the group from both the students and the alumni uh, sometimes had help from others that did not look like them. However, the reality of it is that the universal approach to career development and planning leaves out students of color and widens the success gap. This inquiry was significant to the students it intended to support. McCollum in 1998 shared that black students benefit from interventions that improve their career aspirations, expand their career expectations, and prepare them to make career decisions to help them attain, a, attain their career goals. Yet black students maintain a level of hesitancy for exercising principal tenets of career development and decision making. Participating in a project of this magnitude gave the students structure and confidence to take ownership of their post-graduation goals. Encouraged by Park Cianci, she posited institutional assistance can help fill the gaps in students' access to social capital resources. This project moved them from towards those social network resources that the institution had already embedded when they came to campus. Participation in this project was also important for Latinx students because it contributed to personal support beyond the family and close friends. Although the study by Viela on uh, advanced educational aspirations of Latinx transfer students recommended um, that practitioners consider and maintain awareness of the importance of family. She also encouraged that career services practitioners encourage um, self-efficacy for Latinx students. This project accomplished this result by challenging students to take stock in their resources, the, the resources they needed to achieve their goals by examining themselves, surrounding themselves with um, others and developing strategies and action plans. Black and Latinx um, people are highly discriminated against through throughout their college to career experience. Entering a job market that will not that was not created to receive their talents and skills and skin or knowledge is a painful one. 
but we are here to support them in the process and change and disrupt the system. If not now, then when? This is the time that we make the change. This is the time that we provide the true support to expand the social capital of the students that we bring in. Career Services holds the key in usurping uh, the fences of discrimination by helping racially minoritized students engage the networks that they inherit when they matriculate to campus. Awareness and skill building are critical in developing resilience in navigating the college to career transition process. And career centers have the tools and resources to do this. I cannot take on the system of discrimination alone. Racism ahead is a large scope and was outside of the scope of this inquiry. However, in the place of my practice in career services and specifically career education and development here at Stockton, alongside with institutional agents, my community partners, faculty and staff, together we can cultivate a strategic effort to support black and Latinx students their career, college to career transition. Thank you, I hope I didn't drone on too long. I appreciate you hanging in there with me. Um, I will now open the floor for questions. Thank you, Terry. So we have about 15, less than 15 minutes left of the session. So we may go over for those who may want to stay and ask their questions or have commentary. Um, but if anyone has questions for uh, Terry, please just let us know. Collins P, you yes, go ahead. This is Trish Collins. Hi, Hi Trish. Hi, how was everyone? Good presentation, Terry. I have a question. How can the institution fight some of the challenges that you were speaking of in your presentation? Um, with regards to unemployment for Black and Latinx students, um, and just some of the, you know, the other challenges that we have to ensure that our students are prepared. And it's not so much of getting the students at the institution. We can recruit, but what is a focused message um, to really ensure that we are able to retain those students and that they're provided with some type of a mentor. That's what, you know, I think is one of the things that we really need to look toward in the institution, um, you know, of trying to match these students so that they have someone that, um, you know, whether it's a faculty or a senior staff member or someone that they just have a comfort level with. So when there's issues that come about, if they can't get to, just say if it's an EOF student or if it's, you know, another student, if they can't get to the appropriate area of the institution, that they're ensured that they have those tools in place, um, you know, so that their success at Stockton can be just that. Um, that's Thank you, question. Trish. So I have, I got two, um, two messages out of, of your question. So the first part was about how do we fight this for our students, the unemployment. Um, and so it, it is just that, right? It is, we are a body of professionals who know someone who knows someone. This is about sharing resources. So it's not enough for uh, the four professional staff members in my office and myself to help 10,000 students, but it's for the body of Stockton, the, the faculty and the staff, and we go to professional conferences, we know people around the country, if not around the world, um, and, and getting to, to have those career circles in different locations throughout the, the, um, throughout the, uh, the institution so that, um, that essentially what we're crea creating is a web, right? And so yeah. that's how you start to make the largest impact. I'm not against, so the reason why I chose a coaching model and not a mentorship model is because mentorship um, is iffy at best, um, meaning you can either have a really good partnership or you can have one that just tanks and it, it, 
it wasn't enough time to create the momentum that I was looking for to to expand that social network, at least the knowledge of social networking, instead of it being really that organic mentorship build, it was purposefully injected into this project. Now, I did realize, and I'll let them know ahead of time, if there comes a time where a student and the coach actually end up being um, mentored off the side of this project, I encourage that. Um, And so that does happen. So I think here at Stockton, we need a two-pronged approach. We need to have we need to have that and mentor at, at, at both instances. They need to be going concurrently. Um, so so that so for instance, someone like myself who is very introvert had may have um, maybe it may be uncomfortable for me to do a one on one, but within a group small group setting where the pressure is not so much on me, but to sit back and learn and take in the information and then contribute that might be easier for some students, but I think it can happen at the same time, Mm -hmm. two types Mm -hmm. of of programming. And the other thing that you had said was um, focusing the message. I think once that this becomes important top down, that's when the message gets to change. Perfect, thank you so much. Again, I enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Trish. Are there any other questions or comments that people want to make at this time? We still have time. Anna has her hand raised. Okay, I'll allow her to talk. Hello, Dr. Carr, I really appreciated your presentation. It was very authentic. Um, There was one comment that you made um, about students just being hesitant. That doesn't mean that they don't want support or help you know, or advice, it's just that they're hesitant to ask okay. those questions. So how can um, maybe work-study supervisors um, teach students to be more vocal about their needs? Like, what, what are some of your recommendations for um, work-study supervisors to help build that social capital or to teach the, the student workers how to build their social capital? I think that's a good question. What I what I take from that, um, I, initially, when I think about uh, the hesitancy to ask for help, um, it wasn't just what I noticed, and I didn't get a chance to share here, is that Sean is not a first-generation student. She's a second or third-generation student, um, so she understands and comes from uh, folk that that have college knowledge. But she was still very hesitant. She was a med student or or a pre-med student. And so the idea here, particularly as it pertains to black and brown people, is that from the outside, we say we got it. And that people say, oh, you have it. You got it. Keep going. But it doesn't leave room for questions. So it's trust building. It comes down to trust building. um, And that was what we were able to accomplish in the small groups. And so when you're thinking about federal work study um, supervisors, I think that that comes in the, um, in the actual maybe building of the, the rubrics of the things that you want your student workers to learn in your care, because they are students and they are uh, malleable and, and they, they're fertile ground to pour into, not to just sit at the front desk and answer phones, but these are growing professionals, the professionals that we want um, that will ultimately come behind this COVID and take care of us in one way, shape, or form. And so it is up to us to cultivate that in them. So I think as a federal work study supervisor, it would have to start in how you see your work study student, how you value them, and how you Um, utilize your rubric um, to make sure that they are gaining the tools and the 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 techniques to be um, to have that self-efficacy trait for lack of better word thank you that was good thank you okay you have another hand raised Arnaldo hi Arnaldo can you hear me I can. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you. And, and secondly, I, I'm very proud that someone's doing actual research, actionable steps, actually, you know, that, that, to help us out. Uh, 
I would often think of my own situation when I was coming up and of course, first generation and college knowledge that was not uh, a subject of any of our family members. Uh, but once you graduated, you, know, you were so involved in just focusing on graduation that you really didn't know what to do after you, you know, you're lost. Mm -hmm. and there was no sense of direction. Uh, no one's telling you where to, where to look or what opportunities there are for a BA or uh, are you going to be a teacher? Oh, oh, great. You know, suddenly you're a teacher, um, but things come at you and you really, well, my question is how we can be more uh, proactive in when we have students uh, Latinos, Blacks, whatever, that come in and say, well, we're here, we're going to pass your course, but where, what do we do now? Well, how's this going to help me? You know, how's, how's this course going to help me and where can I apply? And oftentimes when I teach, I tell them, well, you know, you, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to fill out an application for the federal government, you know, and you can apply for local government too, and there's the municipal. So, a knowledge of, of the surroundings, you know, where to apply the service industries, how your BA can help you or BS, you know, whatever you study, you can have a focus for a career, but if you don't find what you, a career and what you studied in, and that's another challenge. Oftentimes what we major in, we're not going to be working in. That's right. So, but, you know, the, the, uh, the question is that we need more direction. How do we, help direct these students uh, via the institution to let them know, well, you can apply here. This is the government we are governed by locally. Here's the state government. Here's the federal government. You can start filling out applications and feel them out or aside from what you study. So I don't know how to go about <laughs> asking them, you know. The hesitancy is important and the trust is super important because they're not going to reach out. And unless one forms a trust, like you say, it's not going to happen. I think one one thing when you start to have those conversations is to, instead of, I think one of the mistakes that we make um, uh, typically is asking students what, what do they want to do. Exactly. Um, and uh, I think the important is is what, what, what impassions you, like, what do you think about um, and, and what gets you excited? Um, and even if it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm majoring in poli sci because I want to go to law school, but I really like sculpting, but you know, my parents will never allow that. I actually had a student from um, uh, New York uh, when I was at my small liberal institution who um, was forcibly majoring in uh, history to go to law school, but she, honestly didn't want any of that. She just wanted to work in a museum. So it's really about following your passion and helping them understand that the money will flow where you where your interests are. And so part of that is breaking the chain of uh, the myth that your career equals your major or that your career is even linear. Um, and so that's part of our charge at, in career education and development, which is why I changed the name from Career Center, because it's very transactional. It's go there, look at your resume, but that's actually not the way that e the economic system is even set up anymore. You have to know who you are internally. So you have to be able to, for lack of a better word, and they've been beating this in the bush the whole COVID time, is to pivot, Right. You have to be able to pivot, and the only way to pivot is to understand your, your strengths, your goals, your mission, what impassions you, and what your values are, whether that be family-connected or personally, religiously, whatever that means. And those are the things that they have to start thinking about internally, what's really important to them. And those are the conversations, one, that are uncomfortable. Two, they're not – no one asks you that. You know, what do you want to do when you grow up? How are you going to make money? Um, and so those are the, those are the di more difficult questions and those are the harder myths to break. Um, and so That's part right. of our goal in career education and development is to actually start that process, to start talking about and do that internal reflection work. Um, so it, it, that's a hard one, Arnaldo. Arna, it's a hard one. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, we have someone else, Sequeta Sweet. I'll, uh, oh, Sequeta, no, okay, never mind. Oh no. She's, un oh no, she has a hand raised, hold on. Okay. You have Dr. the floor? Dr. Sweet. Hi, Dr. Carr. Good to, good to see you. This was a, an excellent um, presentation. I was wondering um, how, what, what you learned or what from your dissertation or your study you are using now in, your, in, in this, this position that you hold. Uh, and then what more do you have to add? Um, <sighs> I know there's tons more, but I just wanted you to speak about that a little bit. Like what put a, put a cape what, on me. Yeah, exactly. What what find you know, what of, of the findings and of the research that you did, what were you able to what have you been able to kind of implement here or prepare right. to implement? And I noticed you said you changed the name I did. of the the um uh organi the department. Center, yeah. So those those types of things. What what from the um the research and the findings did you have you implemented or looked or looking to implement? Thank you for that. Um so the one thing that what we are working to implement are the career circles here. Um and we are fortunate to have such great partners with the student transition program, first Ospreys um, and, and uh, EOF to be able to start piloting some of this and potentially with um, student success services. Um, and then the overall goal is to get those circles going in each of our career communities so that students of um, first generation students or black and brown students have that have access in the industries that they're that they're interested in. Notice that mine was not industry specific. Um, because what we needed was to learn just the general tools. Um, and so that's part of my, my vision for the work that we will do to make this office equitable. Um, and, and then the other part to that is to continue to break down uh, barriers and thoughts about what it means to talk to a career um, professional and, and essentially starting with the uh, campus climate and helping our colleagues understand that we do more than resumes and and presentations on overviews of what we do, but actually talk about and start to do that education and developmental work. Nice. Okay. <laughs> this is nice. And then stuff. buy me a cape at the end. Yeah, <laughs> you'll need several capes at this point. Uh, so, so um, really taking what you've learned and uh, almost kind of institutionalizing it, you know, being able to, um, you know, bring in, in the components. Are you doing additional research in this yes. area? Yes. What? So actually what I'm thinking of because of this, what I noticed after my research was complete is that I didn't utilize critical race theory. And what I'd like to do and what I did not see in the research was critical race theory being applied to career services. Okay. So that will be interesting. Uh, <laughs> wish, wish you well in this Thank area. You. Great presentation. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other final comments or questions that anyone would like to ask Dr. Carr? All right, Dr. Carr, there are no more questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm sorry it was 40 minutes. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that, but thank you. I'm very passionate about this area, so I appreciate working with all of you. And uh, you guys have a good rest of your day and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.